Hello, and welcome to the 147th episode of From Alpha to Omega. Today is Monday, the 7th of March, 2022, and I'm your host, Tom O'Brien. This week, I'm delighted to welcome Professor Robin Hannell to the show. Professor Hannell and previous guest, Michael Albert, are the people behind Participatory Economics, or Paracon for short. It is a vision of a decentrally planned socialist economy, whose planning process we will be discussing in detail in this episode. Part two of this discussion will be released as a patron-only episode later today. So, if you like those patron-only episodes, or creating Discord over on the Discord server, head on over to Patreon and throw me a few commie dollar. Okay, to the interview. So, Robin, the approach that you've taken in Paricon, tell me if I'm if I'm totally wrong here, but it, it seems like that you have taken the work of Oscar Lang and kind of reconfigured it for a kind of a decentralized approach. Is that a fair description of the, what would you say, your allocation process within Paricon? Interesting question. I've never been asked that before. And that means that the answer is going to be a little complicated. Okay. The basic answer is no. And, and the basic answer is no, because if you look at Oscar Langa's sort of proposal about this is how we can do socialism, it's a version of market socialism. And as, as, as a matter of fact, you could argue that in the history of, you know, in, in, the, in the intellectual history of, you know, theor- theoretical writings about socialism, that Oscar Longo was the first one to propose a version of socialism that was a, ver- that was a kind of market socialism. Now, the, I mean, the other thing I'll throw in is that Longo's purpose in doing that First of all, he was a brilliant economist. He did a lot of other things that were very, very good. In a lot of ways, he foreshadowed Keynes and had Keynesian insights about things before Lord Keynes became the famous one, you know, who taught us something about, you know, how to deal with recessions, depressions, etc. But Langa developed his model of market socialism as part of the debate that was called the socialist calculation debate. And what happened was early in the 20th century, people like von Mises and Hayek came along and argued that this whole idea of socialism that people were talking about in the early 1900s as a planned economy, it was just a total practical impossibility that you could never do all the kinds of calculations that are necessary for running an economy efficiently in that way. And they argued that you needed markets. They also argued that you needed private ownership. And Langa developed his model as a way to prove that at least in theory, you didn't need private ownership. You could have public ownership and that you could answer the the sort of challenges of the anti-socialists about, well, how could you possibly, you know, discover what the value, you know, what's the marginal productivity of different resources and we want to use them efficiently, et cetera, et cetera. He said, well, look, we can basically set up something that he viewed as sort of a pseudo market. And we can go ahead and allocate all those resources through this pseudo market procedure that he described as his rebuttal to the anti-socialists. Then after that, I don't even think that he was in particular, I don't think that his goal was to propose a version of socialism that, you know, that was a market version. I mean, he was he was debating theoretical points about whether any sort of socialism was was a coherent possibility. But after he published that, then as other people came along and decided we believe in a market socialism, not a planned socialism. They latched on to his model and said, well, yes. And one of the interesting things about his model, and here's where there is a certain similarity. In markets, what happened is buyers and sellers make offers and they accept deals. And some of those deals are struck at prices that are not actually the price that would leave us equilibrium in the market. And what Langer proposed was, 
Well, we're going to we're going to eliminate and, and all professional economists know that when mark when deals are struck in market systems at prices that are not the equilibrium price, there's a certain degree of inefficiency. So if you have trading at non-equilibrium prices, you have inefficiency. That's a really good professional economist long understood that. And so he proposed he proposed not only a rebuttal to the anti-socialist is impossible, you know, school of thought in the in the socialist calculation debate. He also said, hey, we can improve upon the actual markets that have existed in reality for all these centuries. What we need to do is make sure that we don't let anybody trade until we have gone ahead and reached the equilibrium price. So he proposed, it was called a tantamant, where the different actors in his socialist economy would propose you know, certain things, but until, until the prices, until there was no longer excess demand or supply in any of the markets, we wouldn't let the deals go through. Instead, we would wait until we had and we had found the equilibrium prices, and then and only then would the deals go through. And he said, "This is a great improvement on capitalism. This is a great improvement on any market economy that we've had in history because it prevents the inefficiency that every professional economist knows is inherent when deals are struck and carried out at non-equilibrium prices." So. You asked a question that I warned you the answer was going to be long, but that's a question that very few people, you know, I've never been asked it before. Now, what is the relevance of Langa's system to the proposal called a participatory economy? Okay. And it is true that we propose that annual planning be carried out in a way where workers' councils are proposing what do we want to do? That is, what do we want to produce? How much do we want to produce of different things? And in order to do that, our proposal includes what are all the inputs that we are proposing that we would use to produce what we are saying we want to produce. And we have consumer councils that are also putting in proposals saying this is what we'd like to consume. And in our annual planning process, one of the things that we, what we propose is that we don't need central planners to come up with a, you know, the solution to how do you coordinate all this so it's feasible. That there is no reason that the councils making the proposals can't do this for a certain number of iterations until they go ahead and reach a plan that's actually feasible that could be carried out. So we want a system of planning that isn't a market system, but it does use something that in the history of economic thought on the subject of socialism in theory, you know, is associated with Oscar Langa, who's the first one who, who talked about this sort of kind of procedure. It's, it's like it pushes that procedure from the center of the, the planners out to the distributed That's people. right. We want, yeah. to eliminate the, we want to eliminate the central planners. And we want to do that on the basis of, and we want to do that for, three, for two reasons. One is we don't think that was the we don't think that if you go back to the original socialists and the original socialist vision of socialist visionaries and workers fighting for socialism, we don't think that they never envisioned the kind of central planning bureaus being involved in the way they were involved that is what actually turned out in the Soviet Union and then later in the Eastern European countries. We don't think that was ever part of the socialist vision that somehow that got off track. I mean, Very we, early. We this, I mean, it, yeah. got off, it got off track in when, when revolutions took place where you had a single, you know, Leninist political party in charge. So I think part of the reason it got off track is the entire political system was no longer sort of democratic and participatory and they weren't looking for, you know, the kind of economy that would be participatory. But in any case, it got off track. What we've been from the very beginning, we were anxious to propose a way around that. How can you not leave things to just markets to decide, but also not have a central planning authority based on the fact that our reading of the historical experience and the outcome of that was not only it wasn't what originally not only wasn't that what socialists originally envisioned, 
it all we now have demonstrable historical evidence that it turns out to be a very poor way to run an economy for a var variety of reasons. And, and I think the basic underlying reason is that you have disempowered workers and consumers, and therefore they become disinterested, and you get the kind of sort of going through the motions type outcome for very, very predictable reasons. So what we've proposed is something that we believe is the alternative to no, you don't use markets, but no, you do not empower central planners over. Now you could say, I mean, anybody that any, anybody that supports central planning will describe it in the following way. They'll say, well, the production units make proposals, but they don't know whether or not that proposal is actually efficient and fits in with other proposals. So the central planners have to sort of say, You've sent it a proposal, but we have information and we know that that proposal isn't good and isn't acceptable. So we're going to say no to that. And we're going to then say, you need to modify your proposal in the following way. And in our proposal, nobody can propose for a worker council except the worker council. And nobody can revise that proposal except the worker council. And that's sort of the bottom line, how we want to protect worker self-management from sort of from from a central bureaucracy that we just think stifles economic activity. Yeah, like fundamental to the vision of socialism as it was originally conceived is the workers in democratic control, the means of production. Put that in contradistinction with a central planning bureau. The two are basically they're in contradiction with each other fundamentally. Um, yes. That that I mean the origin I mean as socialism socialism arose in opposition to capitalism, and at the at the factory level at the level of the workplace it rose in opposition to we don't want the capitalists with the managers who they hire to be in charge of deciding what we produce and how we produce it, but in central planning what you ended up with was the central planning bureau essentially was going to decide what was produced and how it was produced in these different workplaces. And the central planning bureau would very soon discover, I mean, you could have been in theory, in theory, the management of a centrally planned economy enterprise, you know, could be voted on by the workers there. On the other hand, if the, if the place has to carry out the dictates of the central planners, what they're going to very quickly discover is we want those managers of that process to be responsible to us. We don't want them to be responsible to the workers in their own workplace. And so very quickly, you sort of develop, not only did the authoritarian tendency of having the Central Planning Bureau making, making all the important decisions, not only did that happen, it sort of worked its way down through the actual managerial hierarchies in all these centrally planned enterprises, where they became responsible to the central planning, you know, and the, and the Communist Party and the Central Committee of the Communist Party, rather than, you know, to the work. These were not representatives of the workers in the, in, in the workplace. These were managers that were that essentially were there to carry out the dictates of the central planning ministry and who were held responsible for doing that. I mean, yeah. they, were, they were rewarded and punished according to that criteria, rather than whether the workers that they supposedly represented you know, were pleased with what they were doing. Yeah, like it, you said uh, earlier that that it was, say, the Leninist party, they came in and got rid of that. I would say I would bring it further back. Like I would bring it, say, you know, not long after, say, I think Engels' death, we had Hilferding's finance capital and the approach of the general cartel. And like, you know, we, we see the calculation debate is really in response to, to kind of his theory as opposed to the theory that would have been, say, of the idea of a of a communist society or socialist society of, say, Marx or Engels or, or the equivalents in anarchist tradition prior to that. Tom, I think you're right. I'm just amazed that as an Irishman that you are this familiar with Lange and Hilferding and all those Central European, you know, theorists. That's that's quite admirable. It's, uh, yeah, yeah, I don't know if admirable is the right word. Maybe sad. Sad is probably a better <laughs> word. Um, okay, let me, let me go on. To, so I have some questions about the formal model. Okay, so this is, we did a little bit of this uh, the last time with Michael. So they might be familiar with me setting up the general model. But essentially it works out as a big matrix, you know, a series of linear algebra equations that gets solved. And 
The inputs into this are things like, you know, the labor inputs, uh, subjective preferences, the materials that go into, you know, each product, etc., etc. And we're trying to solve all of this based on a few constraints and figure out what price balances all these requests. So we have people saying, I want to consume this, the producer saying, I want to produce this much, blah, blah, blah. And we try and find prices that essentially get to that equilibrium that we were talking about earlier. So that's the kind of formal model. Now, I come from a kind of a, a, a labor theory of value type tradition. So I know you don't chime with that. So the thing I want to interrogate here, like I think I gave Michael some hassle about it. So I'm going to give you a bit of hassle here now as well. So we'll see how we get on. Is um, you have the vector, I think it's V, which is uh, relative social values of produced goods. So this is essentially where we get our subjective preferences into the model. Is that correct? Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, I'm not sure which book you're kicking some particular V out of. Yeah, sorry. So this is the 92 one. So this is whatever, like whatever. Okay, so it doesn't have to be the exact same vector, but there is a subjective preference within the formal model, say. Well, if if you're doing a formal model of central planning, what the central planners need, they need to know what is the relative value that consumers put on the different consumption goods the economy can produce. And so in a model, of, if, if I'm doing a model of central planning, then what I basically say is, well, the social welfare function that the central planners are trying to maximize is how much of each good are we, can we produce? That's a final good for consumers. How much of each good should we produce? And in order to know the answer to that, we have to know how much do the consumers value a unit of this good compared to some other good? So in that particular book, the V is, that's what the V is. Now, V in Marxism is the labor value of any good. And, and one of the things that, I mean, I, th- th- this is a bone of contention between um, Cockshot and Cottrell and those of us who you know, advocate for participatory in their view, it's the, the only thing we need to worry about is the, indirect, the, the direct and indirect labor that goes into things to come up with a sensible plan. And, and you're right. I, I would contest that. And, and, and here, here is the simple way I would put it. What does it cost society to produce something? Part of what it costs society is somebody had to do some work. And... And that, that part of what it costs society has two components. The first component is just working an hour at a particular kind of task probably is not as pleasant as leisure. So there's mainstream economists called the, the disutility of labor. Just putting out more effort, you know, working at tasks that aren't very pleasurable. So there's that social cost of producing things. Then to produce things, we need certain amount, certain kinds of labor. And at any point in time, there's only so many carpenters. There are only so many engineers. Now we have educational systems programs and apprenticeship programs where we can change that over time. But at any point in time, we only have so many carpenters and so many engineers. So if you use an engineer to produce this good, then you don't have them available to produce some other good. So there's a scarcity opportunity cost of using labor, as well as uh, labor isn't very pleasant compared to leisure. That's not all. When we produce things, we also use certain amounts, we, we use machines. Now it's true that those machines were produced in the past and you could say, well, in some ultimate sense, that machine reduces to the amount of unpleasant labor it took to produce it. But at any point in time, we only have so many machines, just like we have so many carpenters. And therefore, if you use the machine to produce this, there's an opportunity cost in the sense that it couldn't have been used to to produce something else. And then finally, you could think that, well, but all machines were produced by labor. But there are some things that you can't make that argument for. And this is where I think that Marxism was a pre-environmental sort of thought system about economics. There are inputs from the natural environment and there's only so many acres of scarce bottom land, you know, with decent rainfall. And 
there's an opportunity cost of using it to produce corn rather than producing potatoes. And so for us, the social cost of making anything is the opportunity cost of using different inputs from nature, the opportunity cost of using, we only have a certain stock of machines here in the present, the opportunity cost of using different categories of labor and the sort of, Michael calls it the degree of ownerness. That's a word I don't know why anybody would ever use. I mean, there are other simple words. <laughs> It's unpleasant, undesirable. It's work where I get dirty or it's work where I get exposed to toxins and I get sick and I get ill. All of those are social costs of making things and, and, and they simply do not reduce to the number of hours of labor directly and indirectly that went into making it. Maybe that's okay. a big part of the social cost, but it certainly is not all of the social cost. And so we want a system where we're sending the right signals to both consumers, councils, and workers' councils about what does it really cost society to produce this if you want to consume it? What does it really cost society if you want to use it as an input in a production process that you are proposing to use to asking permission to, to be able to use in the planning procedure? Okay, so yeah, no, that's that's all good. And um, there's probably a load of things we could go off on tangents there. So I'll try and keep it quite narrow. So let's think about this subjective preference vector. So within the, the, the process of Paricon, there is this idea of how to give this ranking to the social value of all of these different products to, to take into account all these, these things you're saying, you know, the opportunity cost of labor, of et cetera, et cetera. But like, I was just looking at Amazon there a few weeks ago and they have 500 million, 500, I think it's 550 million products listed the last, at the time I, I checked how can you give a, in a practical sense, how can you give a subjective preference to 550 million products? Okay. We've given a name to this problem. We've called it the high-heeled, yellow-toed woman's size eight shoe problem. I, I've actually forgotten it. But everybody that's read the book sort of knows that's what we've called it. You're asking a question that there's two, there's... Two people out there in the debates about models of socialism who've dismissed participatory economics on the grounds that planning economy, you know, for the for the coming up with a plan, you're asking, well, how do you get the actual social cost, you know, of of all these billions of different, slightly different things? They asked the question saying, well, how could you possibly come up with a plan that was going to plan how much of exactly, you know, how many of all these billions of different products? And David Schweikert, in his original response to, to Michael's book, Per, per Econ, said, well, it's just nonsense on stilts. I mean, we, we don't even have to really talk about it because, you know, for this reason, the editors at the Jacobin, said exactly the same thing. And they, they, they used the Amazon. They were saying, Schweikert said it a little earlier before, before we bought everything on Amazon. But the editors at the Jacobin basically said it, you know, after, and they, they cited the number of different products available on Amazon. How could you possibly plan an economy? This is a question about comprehensive planning. Is comprehensive planning really possible when you look at all the number of goods? And... I'm going to give one very simple answer. You know, they didn't do it well, and I can certainly make proposals about how they could have improved upon it, but the Soviet Union and the Eastern European countries and China and Cuba did comprehensive planning for decades and decades and decades. I don't champion how they did it. I'm very critical of how they did it, but it's obviously not a real world impossibility. <laughs> now, some people would very quickly say, well, part of the reason that it was feasible is that, you know, the, they didn't have the variety of products, that everybody had to wear shoes that looked exactly like everybody else's shoes. And it is true compared to capitalism, really existing socialism using central planning in the 20th century, one of its deficiencies was that it didn't provide the variety of options you know, that consumers would like to have. 
But it's obviously not just, you can't dismiss it as a practical impossibility, the idea that comprehensive planning is impossible on those grounds. And we've, then, we, we've gone ahead and given longer answers too. Well, the planning part is done in terms of sort of broader categories. The plan just has to come up with a plan for shoes. It doesn't have to come up with a plan for how many shoes of this kind or that kind. That's the kind of thing that can actually be worked out as the year goes on, you know, during the production process. We're not talking about a plan that would have. So when you look at the matrix that we're talking about, we're looking at a matrix that isn't a matrix with hundreds of millions, you know, of columns and rows, because you've got hundreds of millions of, of products that you're planning for. You basically do the planning. The comprehensive planning is done in terms of what you might call sort of broader categories of goods and services. And it's proven in the past that that's perfectly possible. And I, I don't think, I mean, we could talk about this. There are ways to enfranchise the consumers to make sure that consumers' desires about we want shoes that look like this, not that. We want more of this. We want it more that way. There are ways to enfranchise the consumers in a comprehensive planning procedure, which we've tried to do in a participatory economy, way beyond. I mean, there's no doubt that consumers were disenfranchised in the centrally planned economies. But the fact that the central planned economies functioned in some ways reasonably well for decades proves it's not an impossibility. And there are very, very good ways that we should take advantage of to enfranchise the consumers and the consumer federations in the process of deciding what it is that's what it is that's being done. Yeah, like I don't have a problem with, say, the concept of it being able to be done. I think that that's it's technically feasible. You know, I, I think especially today with bigger computers solving these, you know, big matrices, you know, it's not. It's not a difficult thing. Now, I know we don't solve them in, you do it in a process of planning. But what I kind of feel is when I look at the model that a, a lot of the politics within the society, okay, is actually put into the planning process through this subjective preference for these type of objects. And so like the decisions on what society decides is more important is actually in, this is contained in in, in this like subjective preference and the ability for for somebody to for everybody to actually put their subjective preference in seems to me to be a problem in like, terms in it, well the subjective preferences are the preferences of consumers right but and, say for example say me take me for example i'm sitting here and like you know, maybe I like a computer and maybe I like this and that. But there are broad swathes of the economy where I, I have I have no idea of what my subjective preference is or is not. And I wouldn't even know what my subjective preference is maybe until sometime in the future. And so what happens is, is that other people's subjective preferences can reorder things outside of what my subjective preference actually would be. So I, I feel like there is a huge amount of the politics in the society is put into this thing and that will determine the the course of the solution of what are the prices well let me say two different things that are relevant to what you're talking about okay one is i was joking around probably a little too much when i talked about well wait a minute i mean the the question that was asked that i was responding to was well, how would I as a consumer even go about drawing up, you know, a list of all the things that I want to ask to consume? I mean, you can show me, you know, you can show me the relative prices of different things, but how would I even go about, you mean, I'm going to have to submit a proposal, you know, that says these are all the things I want to consume during the year. And my answer to that was, well, if you want consumers' preferences to influence what the annual plan is planning to make, you have to get that information from them. Now, what you're saying is, well, it might be personally difficult or problematic to provide. And my answer was, well, I can tell you what I would do. I would just submit the same thing I submitted the year before. 
And I wouldn't spend too much time thinking about it. But is that a difference between what your consumption, what you want for consumption versus what your subjective preferences are? We're not asking people to send subjective preferences. We're asking people to we're we're asking people to just say how much of these different things do you would you like to con- you the consumers are going to basically have an income, and we're simply asking them for what would you with that income, what do you think you would like to be consuming this year, and 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 we're asking them in basically sort of broad categories, and. The question is, well, would would I mean some people's reaction to that was, as a person, I would find carrying out that task either difficult or I wouldn't like to do it. I don't want to do it. I just find it an imposition. Well, what's the alternative? Well, the alternative is in a market economy, in a capitalist economy, you go to the mall, you know, or you go on Amazon at you know 10 o'clock at night. And that's when you decide, when you see something. So we're asking people to sort of try and give us the best guess you can of what it is that you're going to want to consume this year, because we can't come up with a plan that makes any sense unless you've told us that. And and so what we're dealing with is, well, how difficult or impossible would it be for people to do this and how burdensome would it be? And that's why I gave the example of if I lived in a participatory economy I would spend the, the joking part was this. I wouldn't even I wouldn't even bother, you know, to submit a proposal. So there has to be a procedure for people like me where, well, my my consumer council, when I didn't submit a proposal on time because I was just too damn negligent, they're going to have no choice but to put in the same one that I had last year. And my point is, if even if that's what happens, our planning system works pretty well. Even when you have people like that, you know, who are that negligent, it'll still work pretty well. The the other thing is I could simply put in my proposal from last year. What I would realistically do is how much time does it take you to sit down and work out your taxes every year? And the answer is eight hours, 10 hours, 12 hours. So So what I'm imagining is if people would take 10 or 12 hours to simply go ahead and go through the process of looking at what they consume this year, thinking about what their income for next year's consumption is, making some adjustments here or there. I want to make more trips, et cetera. So I got to put in requests for some vacation stuff. I've got, I I don't need these things anymore. My kid's no longer on the soccer team. That's all that we think that, that in practice, in reality, we think that's that's all that is required for many, if not most people to do in order to give the information that's necessary, provide the information that's necessary so that the annual, pro- so the annual planning process can proceed sensibly based on that information. You've got to give the annual planning process some sort of information about what consumers want. Okay, so I, I, I think I'm, I don't know if I'm a little bit confused because uh, like, I'm thinking like to me, the idea of putting in, say, a consumption request is kind of what we're talking about nearly for next year is like, given I'm going to earn this much, yes. this is the broad category of stuff I want. Yes. I, I'm I'm confusing how that maps to, say, a relative social value. If that's just, that's to me, that sounds more like a supply and demand. Like you, here's here's what we're producing. Here's what we're, we want to consume, but it doesn't seem to say to me on the consumption side or the production side, what is the relative value of the different products? Okay. I, I, I think I understand what you're asking me. So let me try and answer it. When you put in your consumption request, we have to show you what our current estimates of what the social costs of making things are, because you're put, you're not putting a consumption request in based on no information about your income and based on no information about how much we're going to charge you for different things. So when you put in your consumption request, we have to give you a set of prices saying, well, I mean, how would you know whether you want, you know, more steak, you know, whether you want more meat or less meat, unless we tell you something about the price of meat compared to other food items. So now we call those indicative prices. So the consumers are always shown our current best guess at what the social costs of providing different things are. 
which we call the our current indicative prices. And that's what they are responding to when they say, well, okay. I mean, just like when you go into the super, when you go into a store and you and go into the, I only shop and I only shop for food. And so I go into the, I go into this, I go into the supermarket and I go up and down the aisles and there are price tags on those things. That's how I decide to know. That's how I decide what I want to pull off the aisle and what I don't want to pull off the aisle. So we are showing people these indicative prices in the different rounds of the planning procedure. And, and that's, that's how they are responding. But I would kind of come back to you there and say, there's a little bit of a circular logic there that like the, where does this indicative price come from? Uh -huh. Like, so you, when, when you run it the first time, you know, I know in the book, you say you could let everything have the price of one and then you yep. let the thing go on, it, on its way. Th there seems to be a circular logic there. Let me put it like that. There, there's sort of a certain part of economic theory that comes in here that's sort of hard to provide and, you know, in an answer to a single question. Let me, let me try and answer this way. We now have simulated this procedure. And in the simulations, there's two ways you can start the simulations. And one way is you can say, we have no idea what the initial indicative price vector should be. And so in our simulations, I think we just set all the prices equal to 700 for everything. And then we said, okay, now do what we've proposed, simulate what we've proposed. And what ends up happening is in the simulations, it takes about 18 to 20 rounds of our consuming councils and our producing councils responding to that initial price vector. We discover, oh no, given their preferences and you know, given the technologies available, when they respond to those, we get excess demands for some things, excess supplies for other things. We have to adjust the indicative prices. It takes us about 18 rounds of doing that. In the real world, it would be stupid to start with an arbitrary price vector because you always have the prices from last year. And what you're really discovering is people's preferences have changed a little bit. Technologies have changed a little bit. Maybe the supplies of different kinds of natural resources have changed a little bit, and the, we have more of this kind of labor, et cetera. But last year's indicative prices are a hell of a lot better bet of where we're going to end up in this process than if we start with an arbitrary. And sure enough, when we simulate that, what we discover is, wow, it only looks like maybe six or seven iterations before we find what what you're struggling with is somehow there has to be sort of a what came first the chicken or the egg here and the answer is the same as the answer to that riddle which is oh. it's the riddle that's stupid because it's the wrong question what i would say in response to that would be like let's say you have your revolution or whatever the hell and we've got power count coming in and what right. the prices that would feed in would actually be the capitalist prices straight off Right. And they would be a pretty poor set of prices to start off with. That would be more like starting with an arbitrary vector rather than a decent vector from last year. And, and so I, I would be happy to stipulate for the record that the in the first year of doing this planning, since we would be starting with prices that were farther away from the ones we're going to end up with, it might actually take a few extra rounds of the planning procedure for it to work in the first year after the revolution. Yeah, I, I, well, I would expect that the prices would. Well, we're getting into kind of stuff here about like what determines price, and like as a as a Marx type econ economist, dude, I kind of don't like uh, it. I well, know. no, 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 no. It's not about don't like. It's about. I, I think like that the, you know, while not exactly, obviously there's other stuff going on, but things are very correlated to the amount of labor time that goes into it. And like what we would actually be basing these things on is largely coming out of capitalism will be a labor time, clo reasonably close to a, a labor time price as your input. Well, and you know what? I mean, if, if, if the people who try to implement participatory planning because they like the fact that it's very participatory, it allows for a lot of worker self-management, and it's very democratic. If they happen to be from a Marxist background, I would have no objection 
for them calculating, using their big matrix to calculate what is the labor value of everything. And if you want to start the annual planning process with that price vector, I would be very happy to do so. Yeah, like, you know, there's different types of Marxists out here. I'm not a, a big, uh, I'm not a... <laughs> a cockshot type guy so don't peg me like that but uh, no i'm joking but it's like you know I mean, do not, part, I, part of the problem sense. here is part of the problem here is language and when i'm talking to people who are disgusted by capitalism and prices in capitalism and the whole word price you know just sort of doesn't sit well with them then what i what i try to say is okay what we need to know is what is the social cost of making things available to anybody who wants to use them. Workers and consumers cannot make sensible plans about what they want to do unless they have information that's reasonably accurate about what. Is. I don't know how much of certain things I even want to consume unless I know how much they cost society to make. And if you're asking for a whole bunch of things and I have to decide, well, is that a reasonable thing? Is that reasonable for me to say, yes, you should be able to? Unless I know how much it costs society to make the things you're asking for, I don't know whether what you're asking for is reasonable. So we need to know this. This is information that sensible economic decision-making about what should be produced and how it should be produced requires this information. So the question is, can you generate it? And we've sort of proved that in theory you can generate it. But it, they're not prices. I mean, when we, when we, when we first came up with the, with the phrase indicative prices, it was our shorthand way of saying the social opportunity cost of making things. It's our best guess. It's our best guess or our best estimate of what the social cost what it costs society to make something available for somebody to use it. And that's information that I, do, I, I, I will argue, you know, until I'm blue in the face, that I don't want to make a fetish out of it. I'm not claiming that in the real world we would ever get precisely accurate, completely accurate estimates of these opportunity costs. But the better the estimates are, the more sensible our economic plans will be. And we want procedures that are designed so that they will do the best conceivable job of generating that information for the consumer councils and workers councils when they're making their proposals. And, there, and, and, and as we've already discussed, and I don't wanna belabor this anymore, I mean, unfortunately, that's not just the number of hours directly and directly that, make, that, that went into making everything. That's a big part. I mean, for some things it's a, it's probably 90% of the social cost of making some things, but unfortunately, it's probably 15 or 20% of the social cost of making other things. Inputs from nature, directly and indirectly, are a lot more of the social cost for making some things available, whereas inputs from labor, directly and indirectly, are a lot more of the social cost of making other things available. Right. And that's that's where the labor theory of value sort of estimates of how much it costs society to make things sort of breaks down. Yeah, like I would say that you're dead right. Like from from my point of view, I don't argue with you that the labor gets everything in there. Right. It just gets the human cost. And yes. the other the other is, is essentially an externality. So like I would say from my point of view, I feel like that this is what I, I kind of think of as the politics of a socialist society. You know, whether we want to degrade soil, whether we want to pollute our atmosphere, that stuff into the price factor, or we want to or we want to use the inverted commas prices as a determination for how difficult a thing is to do for humans. And then the politics determines external to the pricing mechanism what it is that society wants to do. So that I, I feel like you are coming to an approach where we build the subjective I don't want to say it's subjective. I, I, I'm trying to say it in, in, in the language. Like we're trying to put in all of these different costs into that price and versus having the actual active politics of society decide on what it is we will do or will not do with how much effort we have in our society to make or create stuff. So that's where there's a kind of a, I, I, I think, a conceptual 
difference between the two of us? There is. And I would simply submit that your way of doing it is wrong and unnecessarily wrong. You're, basic, you're assuming that we can make one set of decisions based on one set of uh, on certain information. We can make our economic plans just thinking about the human inconvenience as compared to the human desires for certain things. And then somehow we're going to take care of the environment and the environmental inputs in some other way. We're going to do environmental planning separately through a political process. I think as a totality, I don't think it is in a separated thing. I think it's a, it's a totality. Like when I go to the shop and I buy my, my uh, beef steak, I say, yes, goody, beef steak. But in my, my other aspect of me is also saying we should reduce consumption of beef in the economy at the same time. These two acts can be, they can seem incoherent, but they, you know, this gets down to the idea of using price policy to determine total social action. Why versus you, okay. rea- rational rational choice of of option external when, when, to like your consumption. When, when you go to the market and you're looking there at the at the meat counter and you're deciding whether you want to buy some meat or not, we want you to take into account the fact that it took a certain amount of it, it took the farmers, you know, labor, you know, to to herd the beef and grow the beef. And it took the labor of the butcher to butcher the beef. You want to take that into account. I think we also want you to have to take into account that growing that beef meant that there was methane being released into the environment and it was generating global warming. Because that's also, if you eat beef, that is a consequence that's just as palpable as the consequence that somebody had to wake up early in the morning and go out and herd a cow. And why, if we have, if we've designed procedures that would take all that into account, then why would you want to go to a more primitive system for trying to take it into account? That's, that's sort of my reaction here. It it seems to me you're provoking, you're proposing a more primitive and less perfect way of accomplishing what we have actually jointly agreed needs to be taken into account. Right. But there are many ways of doing it. Like, so one of the, so I come, I've been very, very interested in like the economics of the Dutch and German council communists. So who are probably very closely linked to the anarchist tradition, really. Their stuff tends to get printed in anarchist press. Marxists don't want anything to do with them. But like, they make the case, a very deep case for, as a critique of what was beginning to happen in Russia in, say, the 1920s. And, you know, the prognostications turned out to be incredibly accurate about what happened. That when you have a class of bureaucrats... You're, talk, you're talking about people like Panikuk. Pa- Panikuk and uh, Jan Appel of the Group of in- International Communists. They yes. did, wrote a b- book called The Fundamental Principles of Communist Distribution and Production. Panikuk they, I'm familiar with, and he's yeah. one of my great heroes. Yeah, so these are the, these are fellow travelers. They made this case that when you introduce the ability for a price policy so for people to be able to determine a price as opposed to the labor time input so basically you allow people to decide what is the politics in the society what we're going to do we're going to say this is more and this is less okay and that you break you break the link between the labor done and the price of the thing and so while your solution tries to do that without a group of bureaucrats it still has that distinction between you know the say if we have a labor time price you have the solved i call it i just call it price for shorthand i know you don't like color price that can waver either side away from this and within the the process i think that we we take away from the rationality of product of, of people understanding what is contained in an object on top of that i know you're trying to get rid of the planner problem but we take away what is the human effort in producing stuff? But that breaks this understandable link for people because in the end, they end up with like, they don't end up knowing why why this was solved this year at £24.26 and this year it's solved at £18.93, right? They, that there's a, a, a break in the rationality for the people involved. Okay, I, 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 think, I, see, I think I see another area 
of sort of disagreement or another issue. And, and this is actually a place where Michael Albert and I have long been on sort of different wavelengths. And that is how much time do you want people to be considering various things and arguing various things? And I think part of what you're motivated by is a desire that people would grapple with. We want people to grapple with not just how much, how many hours of labor it took to make things, but also the environmental consequences. And therefore, just showing people prices and saying, how much do you want? in somehow doesn't induce this human grappling with the all the consequences of their choices. There are some of us who would like to force humans to spend more time, you know, grappling with the consequences of the choices that they are making. On the other hand, I lean much more in the direction of their, one of the criticisms of participatory planning that one of my favorite criticisms came from Nancy Fulbright, who's a, a socialist feminist economist here in the United States. I've known her for years and decades and decades and decades. And her, her response to participatory economics was, this is just gonna become the dictatorship of the sociable. And I think there's a tendency on the part of leftists to imagine that everybody's like us. We think that a good life is one where we are all sitting down and grappling with these things. Whereas some people would like to get it done and go fishing. So the fact that we have proposed a procedure, I mean, one of my conscious goals for the get-go has been to make this as easy as possible for people. And now, I mean, central planning makes it easy for people because they don't get to decide anything. Markets make it easy because you don't have to decide everything, anything except when you're in the supermarket, what you take off the shelf. But if we're proposing that we have a social decision-making process of planning and coming to decisions about what we're producing, well, that's going to take people's time and energy. And I think one of the things that will lead it to failure is if we, over, if we overburden it, with the amount of time that people have to take to grapple with certain decisions, if we overburden it with meetings and discussions that take up too much time, and if we overburden it with meetings and discussions and arguments where there's really no objective criteria for sort of settling the argument, there's not even a, a, a reasonable agenda for the meeting in terms of, well, I think we should produce, we should have fewer cows because it's destroying the environment. Well, yeah, but we've cut down on cows and I actually think we've gone too far in that direction. So you think we haven't gone far enough. I think we've gone too far. That's a night, for me, that's the kind of argument and debate that's a nightmare. I'm trying to figure out how can we design procedures that doesn't land us in that nightmare. And one nightmare for me is, look, I've just outlined all the things that objectively go into determining what it costs society to make things. Do you really think that each person should be going through that mental process of trying to do that calculation for themselves and discussing it with other people? No, it is way, way too complicated. You know, and, and what we need to do is design, people need to understand that we're using procedures that are giving us the best estimates possible but then let people use those best estimates to just go ahead and make decisions. They don't have to divide the social cost of, of, of eating a, you know, a steak into how much of that social cost was the labor, how much of it was the environmental damage. That's a process that I don't, the general idea that it costs, you know, that it creates damage to the environment that we need to take into account, that it costs you know, that people have to wake up early and go and herd cattle. Should The general idea that we want all those things to be taken into account, yes. But at some point, they all have to be, you need a system that takes them into account, a system that quantifies them, and a system that comes up with the best estimate you can. And I don't see any purpose in dividing the different parts of that up into one part or another part that we handle through a political process versus an economic process.
On this episode, you heard the theme tune, The Order of the Pharaonic Jesters, and Night of the Purple Moon by Sun Ra and his orchestra. Thank you for listening, and please join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. This show is a member of the Emancipation Network, a Marxist podcast and research collective. Make sure to check out our network sister podcasts, General Intellect Unit, Jumpsuit Utopia, Mortal Science, and Swampside Chats. Thank you.